Elhamdülillahi Rabbil Alemin ve salatu ve selam ala seyyidin ve sünni nebiyyina Muhammed ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ecmain ve yaskallahu subhanahu ve ta'ala that he keeps his firm upon this religion and Allah subhanahu ve ta'ala is pleased with us and that he accepts everything that we have put forth and he makes us of the followers of the son of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with the virtue and the fadl and the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over us, we have another opportunity to benefit from the books of Sheikh Muhammad Rasad Uthameen, Rahimahullah. And over the course of the last few years, we've been going through book after book from this imam, this great scholar. And today, we are going to begin another risala, another book. And without any exception, there's obviously benefit in this as well. Now, the reason why we have chosen this book is because it follows on from the topic that we've had at the end of Lumat al Itiqad, which is talking about following the Sunnah and being warned against bid'ah. Now, as you can see here, this is something which is from the habits of Ahlul Ilm, from the books of Aqeel, from the time of the Salaf. They've been talking about the importance of sticking to the Sunnah and not falling into innovations. And we talked about this previously what is Sunnah? in a general sense, in an aqidah sense, in a manhaj sense, but also a lot of people understand sunnah and bid'ah in a more uh, practical sense, what we call ahkam. And it's important that a person has a distinction between the two. When a person is talking about sunnah, when we're talking about bid'ah, it can refer to ahkam and it can refer to akhbar. And inshallah, the shaykh is going to talk a bit more about that when it comes to uh, the different types of bid'ah. This is actually a lecture that he delivered so many years ago, rahimahullah. And what they've done is they've made it into a book. And the book is called Al-Ibda' Fi Bayan Kamal al-Shar wa Khatr al-Ibtida' Something which is good, something which is amazing in its explanation of talking about the completion of the Sharia and the dangers of innovation. Now, as you can imagine, because it's a lecture, the book itself isn't that extensive in the Arabic. It's about 28 pages, which isn't a lot. Uh, I don't believe it's been translated into English. Um, and if it has, you can refer back to that. And like I said, I don't think it's, it's that extensive. But the book is very good in the sense where the Sheikh, in today's topic, we're going to be talking about the completion of the Sharia. So what he does, in the beginning of the lecture, he talks about how the Sharia has been completed. If the religion is complete, why would you need to innovate? If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has perfected his favor upon us, then why would a person need to deviate from that? And it's very important for us to understand as a principle that when people innovate, they will leave the sunnah. When a person follows the sunnah, he is away from innovation. And there's no two ways about it. So for example, my child, he came home and he recited Qur'an and then at the end of Qur'an he said Sadaqallah al Now with some of the ulama, there is no harm in that because it's mentioned in the Qur'an. Qul Sadaqallah, Tabi'minati Ibrahim wa Hanifa. Say Sadaqallah, this is Surah Ali Imran. But what's the sunnah? The sunnah, the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he used to finish recitation of the Qur'an, as found in Sunnah Nasa'i, he used to say Subhanakullahum wa bihamdik, shalala ilaha 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 now, when a person follows this, he will definitely leave that. You can't do both, can you? You're going to hold on to one or the other. And this is just a simple example of how, and as we will see later on, inshallah, perhaps next week, how innovations kill off the sunnah. And this is not my wording, this is from the wording of the companions and the salaf. When people start innovating into the religion, they will automatically leave the sunnah. And some of it is because there's no reconciliation, but some of it is because of guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If a person wants to follow the Sirat al-Mustaqeem, and as you will find in the books of Tafsir, some of them have said Sirat al-Mustaqeem means Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ihdina Sirat al-Mustaqeem, guide us to Sirat What does that mean? Guide us to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sirat al-Ladheena anamta alayhim. Who is anamta alayhim? Abu Bakr and Umar. Radiallahu anhu. So this is the Sirat al-Mustaqeem. So here the person is asking for guidance. So it's not just like, okay, he said this when he could have said that. It's, no, it's a bit more deeper than that. 
hidayah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is found in the sunnah, as Imam Barbahari says in his sharh as-sunnah, rahimahullah, that Islam is the sunnah. The sunnah is Islam. But we'll talk a bit more about innovation, the definitions of innovations and the severity of innovations and the categories of innovations and how innovations come about uh, and innovations and its types. There's innovations which are asli, innovations which are idafi. We'll talk about all that later. But today, inshallah, in the first part of this lecture, he talks about the completion of the sharia. So he begins with the Qutb al-Hajjah, alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inu wa nasta'gfiru, and I'm sure this is familiar to us all, and he bears witness to the oneness of Allah, that he has no partners, and that Muhammad وسلم, is his servant and his messenger. And this is something which is really important for us to understand, which is when a person begins any kind of Islamic discussion, it should begin in a similar manner. Because the messenger of Allah وسلم, always used to begin by praising Allah, and he used to begin with the testimony of faith, and he used to begin by sending peace and blessings upon himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And there was a narration where some of the ulama have said that it is weak. If a person doesn't begin with this, then the kalam is abtar. Abtar meaning, it's cut off. So imagine you want to advise someone, and you don't say bismillah. Well, imagine you want to deliver a lecture, and you don't begin by praising Allah. There will be very little barakah in it, if any. So this is how the shaykh begins, with the khutbah al-hajah praising Allah by testifying to the oneness of Allah and testifying to the risala of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and then he says something which is quite nice it's poetic Allah ta'ala bil huda wa deen al-haq Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent him with hidayah and deen al-haq and the ulama like similar to what we just said what is huda and what is deen al-haq it comes in the Quran in many places and this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes him as well, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah, bil huda wa deen al haq. The ulama have mentioned huda refers to ilm, ilm al nafi'. And deen al haq refers to practical actions which are accepted in conformance with the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah. So whenever you see in the Quran hidayah with deen al haq mentioned alongside one another, Surah Tawbah, Surah Saf. It refers to ilm, which is of the following of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, correct knowledge and practice. فَبَلَّغَ الرِّسَالَةِ He has conveyed the message. وَأَدَّ الْأَمَانَةِ He has fulfilled the trust. وَنَسَحَ الْأُمَّةِ And he has advised this ummah. وَجَاهَدَ فِي اللَّهِ حَقَّ جِهَادِهِ And he strove with Allah in the best possible manner. حَتَّى أَتَاهُ الْيَقِينَ Until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took him. وَتَرَكَ أُمَّتُهُ عَلَى مَحَجَّةِ الْغَيْضَاءِ And he left this ummah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, upon a clear, clear light. لَيْلُهَا كَنَهَارِهَا It's day is like his night, meaning it's clear. Nobody can say, well, I'm not sure if it's day or night. And this is how he has left the religion, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. لَا يُزِيغُ عَنْهَا إِلَّا هَالِكَ There's no one that deviates from this except that he is destroyed. So now he's talking, I mean, I don't want to read the Arabic and then translate, it's going to take too long. In this first segment, he gives many examples, Shaykh Muhammad, on how the Messenger of Allah has fulfilled the conveying of the message. How he has advised this ummah and he was sincere in his advice, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He strove for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, a, in the best possible way. And he left us upon a clear guidance. It's night is like it's day. Now, when these are all facts, how is it impossible that a person doesn't want to follow the Sunnah of the Prophet? How is it impossible when he has left you with something which is clear, when he was sincere towards you, when he fulfilled the trust, when he strove for the sake of Allah? As we will see from the statement of Imam Malik, if a person was to say, okay, well, I'm not going to follow the sunnah, I'm going to innovate something in cell. In other words, what you are doing is you are accusing Muhammad وسلم, of not fulfilling what we have just said here. That you need to innovate. We're going to talk about that later. Anyway. So in this first bit, he talks about how he left us and he gives us examples. So for example, we have a hadith on the authority of Udhar. He said, 
ما ترك نبي صلى الله عليه وسلم طائرا يقلب جناهيه في السماء إلا ذكر لنا منه علما The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم did not leave a bird in the sky that flaps his wings except that he told us something about that bird of knowledge Now, did the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم come with genealogy? Did he come with, I don't know genealogy is not the right word, is it? Zoology, I don't know but did he come with all... What's the meaning of this? Did he come to tell his companions about animals? What Abu Dhar is saying here is that anything which was beneficial for us, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us knowledge about it. Even if it was something that we saw was insignificant, he brought our attention towards it. Even if it just was a bird in the sky. A mushrik comes to Salman al-Farsi. And he says, your prophet has taught you everything, as in like he told you everything, you have to do it this way and not do it that way. To the point of how you even go to the bathroom, the mushrik is saying, he's surprised or perhaps mocking, Allah knows best. So my father says, no, yes. He taught us everything, even to the point that when we are alone and relieving ourselves. If that's how you are there, then imagine how you are everywhere else. There is no aspect of your life except that there is a sunnah for it. He has taught you that which is going to benefit you. So then, in, that's the narration in Tirmidhi, in the narration in uh, Sahih Muslim, he actually goes on to say, yeah, well, he told us. Well, yeah, he did. He left everything clear for us, even to the point of going to the bathroom. He told us, don't face the qibla, or turn your back to the qibla, and do not make... Istinja or istijmar with uh, less than three stones and do not clean yourself with your right hand. I mean, these are ahkam, we're not going to go into ahkam, but the point that the Sheikh is making here, to the point of how you are alone, a lot of people are just going to just leave that as in this is your own private business. Do what you want, but know the Messenger of Allah down to even that moment of shame, really. A moment of a part of your life where there is disgust, but he sallallahu alayhi wasallam explained that even in your lowest moment there is a sunnah. He left for us the Quran al and in that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has explained for us Usul al Deen or Furu al-Din. Usul al Deen are the foundations. Aqeedah, your creed. Everything that you need to create that foundation so that you've got a religion. And then from that religion, from that foundation, sorry, from that foundation, you've got furu, you've got the branches. So tawheed is usul al deen. So he said, bayin al tawheed bi jami'a an And all the types of tawheed, the three types of tawheed. Wa bayin hatta adab al majalis wa listi'dan. Now these are from the furu. So now the Shaykh is saying here, in the Quran, Let's put the Sunnah aside. If you look at the Quran, the Quran talks about Tawheed, it talks about Shirk, it talks about Nifaq, it talks about the last day, it talks about Jannah, it talks about Hellfire. These are all from the Usul al Deen. It talks about the angels, the prophets, and the books. These are things that a Muslim must believe in. When he believes in those things, he grows in his Iman. He takes benefit. But in the Quran also are the Furu al Deen, meaning Ahkam. Allah tells you do this, Allah tells you don't do that. To the point where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, يَا أَيُّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِذَا قِيلَ لَكُمْ تَفَسَّهُمْ فِي الْمَجَالِسِ فَفْسَهُوا يَفْسَهِ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ How you should sit. This is in Surah Mujadila, ayah number 11. The ayah reads like this, O oh, you who believe, when it is said to you, make space in your majalis, in your sittings, then make space, Allah will make space for you. Now the ulama, we don't want to go into tafsir too much, have three views when it comes to this ayah. Some of them have said it refers to the majalis of ilm. Meaning, when you are sitting in the circles of knowledge, make space for your brothers so that everybody can sit and have access to knowledge. Some of them have said it refers to jihad, fi sabirullah. Meaning, when you are among the ranks, when you are within the, uh, you know, when you are within the, what do you call it? The army. <laughs> I was thinking another word, but when you're within the army, if there is need for you to help one another, then you should help one another. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help you. 
And the third view when it comes to this ayah is general. Which is, now we've done this before in also the tafsir just recently, I mean, this is known as ikhtilaf at tanawah. Meaning, if all three can be reconciled, then we accept all of them. We don't say, okay, I want to pick one over the other. This is a very important principle when it comes to tafsir, is that you might find uh, different scholars giving different examples when it comes to tafsir, but in essence they're all saying the same thing. So the third view is that this is general. It applies to ilm, it applies to jihad, it applies to when you're sitting at home. So imagine you're sitting at home and somebody wants to come and sit down, make room for them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make room for you. Now, I just want to step away from this book for one moment. Because there is a book which is called Akhlaq al-Rawi wa Adab al-Sabi' Akhlaq al-Rawi wa Adab al-Sami' by Khatib al-Baghdadi. I was actually reading this book just recently. And it's a really big book. It's about 1,200 pages long. And in there, basically this book is called Akhlaq al-Rawi wa Adab al-Sami' the akhlaq and the manners of the person who is narrating hadith, meaning the muhaddith, meaning the scholar, the mufti. Wa adab al and the adab and the etiquettes of those people who are listening to hadith. This book is talking about ilm and the importance of seeking ilm and the etiquettes of seeking ilm. Now, like I said, it's a very extensive book. So what he does, Khatib al-Burdali, rahimahullah, he'll bring a chapter and then he'll bring hadith, 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 Narration, 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 and it's just full of statements from the Salaf. And perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will facilitate for us to read that one day. However, I'm just going to read for you some of the chapter titles. One chapter title he says, Come to the Majalis of Ilm with humility. Another chapter title, Come to the Majalis of Ilm barefooted. Barefooted. Now, this is not innovation or anything, this is how the Salaf work. This is how much respect that they used to have towards Naj. Come to the Majalis al Im, what should you do when you come in? Give salam. To the Rawi as well as the Sami'een, meaning the teacher and the, the students. As long as you do not disturb. Now, this is something which is really important. How many times do you find people coming to the masjid, people are praying, people are engaging in ibadah? And all you hear is a loud voice, Assalamu Alaikum. This is against the etiquette. Make room. And now the reason why I'm mentioning this is because this is found in this book here, as well as the ayah. In the chapters here, when it is told to you make room, make room for your brothers. Let the elders sit first. Sit still and concentrate. And now in this chapter, sit still and concentrate, he brings so many narrations, just from the companions, and then from the Salaf that came after the companions, that the companions described their majalis with the Messenger of Allah وسلم, as if birds were sitting on their head. You probably had this before. As if birds were sitting on their head. Meaning, they're not moving at all. For example, Abu Sayyid al-Khudri in Sahih Bukhari, he says, لا يتكلم منا أحدا. When the Messenger of Allah was speaking, none of us used to speak. فكأنما على رؤوسنا الطير. It's as if there was a bird sitting on our head. This is how they used to sit with humility and respect and reverence and silence and adab. From the akhlaq of seeking ilm is that they used to get close. From the akhlaq of seeking ilm is they didn't sit in the middle of the majlis. So the majlis used to be close to together. And what is actually disliked for a person to come over and sit in front amongst the midst of people. Another chapter title, if there are two people that are sitting together, that came together, a person comes and sits in between them. Another thing which is from the adab of the majlis is that if a person gets up for whatever reason, you do not sit in his place unless you've got permission to sit in his place. From the adab of the majlis, and this is how the companions were with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is that they used to kiss his head. And they used to kiss his hand sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, without bowing. So they used to shake his hand, and then they used to, or as you probably find in Arab countries, or the shaykh was walking, they used to kiss. This is from the sunnah of the Messenger, and this is the practice of the sunnah. Without, like I said, I'm, I know I'm going off and we're talking about something else, but I'm just going to have these narrations here. Waqi'i. He narrates to us, Waqi'i. 
bin Jarrah rahimahullah, he used to sit like he was sitting in salat. So the position, but also the humility. Ibn Numair, one of the ulama of the salaf, he saw a person sharpening his pencil and his face changed. He's sharpening his pencil, he looked at him and his face changed. Abdul Rahman ibn Mahdi, it's been narrated here from his students that in the majalis of ilm, he never used to talk about anything else except ilm. He never used to smile. He never used to joke around. And if he saw people sharpening their pencils, he used to take his shoes and he used to leave. Once a person in his majlis left, so he said, Mandahik, everyone went quiet. He said, who's laughing? Everyone went quiet. And then he did, he refused to carry on with the dars. So who's laughing? Until they said, yeah, that man over there. So he says to him, in front of everyone, Tatlub al-ilm, you were seeking knowledge whilst you were laughing. I'm not going to narrate to you any hadith for a period of a month. And dejected him from the majlis. So now, like I said, I know we're going to go back to this book now here, Sheikh Muhammad's book, but I think this is very important. These are akhlaq, these are some of the things that have come to us from the salaf. And these are from the etiquettes of not just seeking ilm, which I feel that a lot of people don't really seek ilm anyway, but when they do seek ilm, the etiquettes of seeking ilm, making sure that a person is doing it correctly so that it will be barakah. And that they're doing it in a manner that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept from them. But also, you can see here that there are lessons just in our general akhlaq. And this is how they were. So this ayah here, Ya ayyuladheena amunu idha qeelun lakum tafassu fil majalis. The Messenger of Allah taught us even how to sit. Even how to sit. I'll give you an example. One time, I was so tired. And Sheikh Saad, Ashitri Hafidhullah, he was sitting there. He was sitting and I was standing. Now, I don't know if you guys do this, I do this, it's a bad habit, and since then I've tried to stop doing it. <laughs> I was so tired, and it's like a sofa, so what I did is I just dropped myself into the sofa, and he was sitting there. So you know how you do that, you know when you go home, you sit on the sofa, you just relax, you go, ah, relax now, and shake his bit. He told me off so bad, he goes, what are you doing, why are you sitting like that? One time I was sh- sitting with Sheikh uh, Saleh Sadlan, and I don't know, I don't know what I was doing. I, 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 just, I don't even remember. And he taps me and goes, "Sit properly. Put your legs properly. Sit properly. What are you doing sitting like that?" The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us the adab of sitting, and this is known with the Tulab al Ilm and the Ulama, as you've just seen examples of. So this is the point that Sheikh is making here. Listi'lan how you speak to one another, how you seek for permission for one another, how you greet one another, how you inquire about one another. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us ayat in Surah An-Nur, chapter number 24, ayah number 27, 28. The ayat are quite extensive. Ya Allah, ladhi Do not enter into, your, into the houses which are not your houses, hatta tasta'nisu wa tasallimu ala ahliha, until you seek permission. And then when you've been given permission, then give them salam. Dha'alikum khayrun lukum la'alikum tathakkaroon. This is better for you if only you knew. And if you didn't know if anybody was there, then don't enter the house. Until you've been given permission. And if you've been told to go back, then go back. Wallahi, how many times do you find a person knocking on your door and they're getting impatient? Maybe you don't want to open the door. That's your haq, Islamically. Phones are the same thing. This is better for you as a purification. Wallahu, be my ta'min wa to the point of your garments, the things that you should be wearing. Now again, this is something that people take for granted. They go on to the websites, they go to the shop, they think, oh, I like that, I'm just going to wear it. No real regard for whether it's halal or haram or not, whether it's befitting for a Muslim to wear it or not, and especially for sisters. And the Shaykh gives many ayats from Surah An nur which talk about women having a particular dress code, but you know, even in this, it doesn't mean that a man can be relaxed. Another example I'll give you when I was with Sheikh Saad, <laughs> there was a person, he was Saudi, and he had um, a suit on, shirt and trousers. And the Sheikh constantly turned to him, he goes, where's your thobe? Where's your thobe? 
go home and get your thobe. Where's your thobe? And he kept saying, I need to get it ironed. I need to go to the mosque and I need to get it ironed. That was his excuse. But the point here is the Sheikh is saying that this is not acceptable. Especially in the Muslim country. Obviously here it's a bit different, so I don't want anybody to under- misunderstand what I'm trying to say. But here... Ayat, Ya Yun Nabi Kulli Azwajiku Banatiku and Isa Mumini Nina Ali Hindu in Jalabi Bihin O Prophet, say to your wives, say to your daughters, say to the believing women to place the jalabib, the jilbab over their body. They this is better for them to remain concealed and so that they will not be harmed. We can no longer fall Rahima and Allah ends this ayah with hijab and jilbab and khimar by saying that he's Ghafur Rahim, that he's been kind towards you. So this applies to women. A lot of men think, okay, that's for women. A man can dress however he wants. Not correct. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even tells us how to enter our homes. وَلَيْسَ الْبِرَّ بِأَنْ تَأْتُمْ بِيُوتِ مِنْ ظُهُورِهَا وَلَكِنَّ الْبِرَّ مِنْ اتَّقَى Do not enter your homes from the back. Rather, bir, piety, is for a person who has taqwa wa'tum buyuta min abwabiha and enter your homes through its correct doors. Now the tafsir of this ayah is that the people in Jahiliya they used to believe that when a person goes for pilgrimage, when he returns home, he should go through the back door, not the front door. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that, well, you're going for pilgrimage, are you trying to attain bir? This is not bir. That you enter your doors, that you go from the back. Well, I can the bit of a but piety is a person who does the right things, stays away from what's wrong. What's wrong with you, Tamil Just go through the front door. So now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is even telling us how to go into our homes. And there are plenty of sunan for that as well. How many people who have no religion or have weakness of religion just open the door and do what they want? But for the person of the sunnah, it's not like that. إِلَىٰ غَيْرِ ذَٰلِكَ مِنَ الْآيَاتِ الْكَثِيرَةِ There are so many ayat التي يتبين بها أن هذا الدين شامل كامل This religion is complete, comprehensive. لا يحتاج إلى زيادة كما أنه لا يجوز في النقص. You don't need to add anything to it. And you don't need to take away anything from it. This religion is complete. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the book and this religion. وَنَزَّلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ تِبِيَانَ لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ we have given you a religion which is an explanation for all things. How can this book be an re- explanation for all things? The Sheikh is saying here, it gives you everything that you need to understand why it is that it's going to be successful for the life of this dunya as well as the akhirah. So the book doesn't explain to you how to make bread, does it? But it gives you the principles you need to know on how to make bread. As an example, how to drive a car. Does the Qur'an talk about that? No, but there are rulings in the Qur'an, in the Sunnah, which tell you, look, this is what you should do, and these are the adab that you should have, and these are the things that you should stay away from. I'm just giving you just random examples, but those things which are far more important are also then included. And this is what the Shaykh is saying. Ayyuhul Ikhwah, my brothers, obviously he's delivering a lecture. In the Ba'd al-Nas, Yufasir Qawdina Ta'ala, Umamin Da'a, okay, so now here, some people, now here is giving us a benefit. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Qur'an, مَا فَرَّتْنَا فِي الْكِتَابِ مِنْ شَيْءٍ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not left anything out from the book. Now this is the Shaykh giving us a benefit. I think the point has already been made. But this ayah he is basically saying here, does it refer to the Qur'an or not the Qur'an? This is the ayah in Surah Al-An'am, chapter number 6, ayah number 38. We have not left anything out of the book. Now this ayah here, chapter number 6, ayah number 38, the ulama have two tafsirs for this. One tafsir is that this ayah refers to the Qur'an. So basically the shaykh is saying here, can you use this ayah to make the point that we've already made? Some of them have said yes. Ma farradna fil kitab min shaykh. We have not left anything out from the book. That is important. I mean everything has been discussed. We have not, ma farradna, we have not, you know discarded anything which is relevant from the book. What book? Some of them said it refers to the Qur'an. The Shaykh is saying here, this ayah does not refer to the Qur'an. This ayah refers to Allah al-Mahfuz, which is the preserved tablet with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, before he created the creation, he wrote that everything that's going to happen until Yawm al this is known as the Allah al-Mahfuz. So the Shaykh is saying here, this ayah here, ayah number six, ayah number 38 from chapter number 6, it refers to the Lawh al-Mahfud, not the Qur'an. So he's basically saying here, this ayah cannot be used to prove our point, but 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَنَزَّلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابِ تِبْيَانًا لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ We have given you, we have revealed the book, and now the Qur'an, because the book has been revealed, so this can only refer to the Qur'an. Tibyan as an explanation, a clear explanation. Bayan لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ For all of your affairs. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after he has given us a book, then he has given us a messenger. And that messenger, if you follow him, the shaykh is saying here, if you follow him, then you will be guided. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to follow this messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is part of the completion of the religion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah An-Nisa, ayah number 80, May yati'il rasul, whoever obeys the prophet, whoever obeys the messenger, faqad Allah. Then he has obeyed Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells in Surah Hashr, ayah number 7, وَمَا أَتَاكُمْ رَسُولُ Whatever your prophet, or whatever the prophet has given you, فَخُذُوا Then take it. Religious advice and rulings and ahadith. وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ عَنْهُ فَانْتَهُوا Whatever he's told you to stay away from, then stay away from. So this now teaches us that the Qur'an is revelation. Part of revelation also is the sunnah. And this now comprises of the complete religion. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Qur'an, may have more than one place. The kitab is the Qur'an. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the word hikmah to refer to the sunnah. So the shaykh is saying here, when you can understand the points that we have made here, we can now understand with full certainty that the Prophet ﷺ did not pass away until he had explained the religion, until it had been completed, until everything had been made clear. The Messenger of Allah ﷺ explained to us all of the things that we needed to know and he explained it to those people who were living within the city and outside of the city. What that basically means is those people who had access to knowledge and those people who didn't have access to knowledge. I mean, this is probably still the case today, but people who um, live in the suburbs are a little bit different to the people who live in the urban areas. So this is what he is saying here. At that time, the people who used to live in the suburbs were very coarse and rude and abrupt and not well-educated. So the Messenger of Allah ﷺ, he explained the religion to his companions, all of them. Those people who had a good grasp of the religion, those people who were probably, like I said, didn't have access to education and, and to those things that other people had. Hence, and this is the last bit for today, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the completion of this religion in Surah Ma'idah, chapter number 5, ayah number 3. Al-yawma akmaltu lakum deenakum. Today we have completed your religion. وَأَتْمَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعْمَتِي And we have perfected my favour upon you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَرَدِيتُ لَكُمْ الْإِسْلَامِ دِينَ And I have been pleased for you as Islam as your religion. اليوم Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say اليوم when the religion was complete from the beginning? Meaning, when Iqra came down, all of that was complete. Nobody can say at the beginning of Makkah period, Islam was not 100%. No, at that time, whatever the Messenger of Allah said, that was complete. So then how is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here in Surah Ma'idah, and this is towards the end of the life of the Messenger of Allah al today the religion is complete, and is already completed. Uh, Ibn Ashur, Imam Al-Qurtubi and others from the ulama of Tafsir have said this shows us and this is precisely the point that the Shaykh is making here Al-Yawm is for emphasis on how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has now categorically completed the religion everything else is abrogated there is nothing which is missing from it hence Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says today your religion has been completed when it was already completed beforehand but to show us the emphasis in that. What does it mean that the religion is complete? Imam Ibn Jawzi, rahimahullah, he says that there are more than five views from the ulama in reference to today your religion has been completed. And I think what we'll do is we'll 
summarize them into three. Number one, today the religion has been completed, meaning, that's it, the obvious meaning, meaning that there is no more revelation. Everything has been concluded, everything has been revealed which needs to be revealed. Another view from the ulama of Tasir, اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم, meaning today, your honor has been completed. Meaning the honor of the Ummah of Muhammad وسلم, has finally now been refined in the most perfect possible manner. And the third view is today your religion has been completed, meaning the support for the Ummah of Muhammad has been completed. And this will continue until your Muqiyam. Isn't it the case that when the Dajjal comes out will be the greatest fitna that the world has ever seen? Yet, who is the one, or which ummah is going to be the one that removes him from the face of this earth? Isn't it that Ya'juj and Ma'juj will come and that is now the greatest fitna after the time of the Dajjal? But who is it that is going to eradicate that fitna also? It's the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Now again, this is ikhtilaf at All of it is acceptable. Meaning, your religion has been completed. Your honor has been completed. Support for you has been complete. Some of them have said everything else has been abrogated. Meaning today your religion is completed, but their religion wasn't. Meaning Ahl Kitab. That's abrogated or they you know they corrupted it, etc. This inshallah will conclude here because now the Shaykh goes on to talking about Ibtida Fiddin, meaning introducing and innovating into the religion. So in the first part, and this is now a conclusion, a summary, what he has basically said so far is that the religion, down to the most minute of details, has been explained to us. Therefore, if a person was to step away from that, then we can clearly see that a person is doing something which is really risky. The reason why is the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one. From the time of Adam to the last man, the religion of Allah is one. The truth is one. You can't say, well, that was true then, it's not true now. Yes, the shara'i could be different. The legislations could be different because of a betterment. But essentially, Islam is one. The truth is one. Hence, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, This is your ummah, and your ummah is one. Meaning, after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the prophets, you'll find this ayah in surah al-anbiya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about prophet after prophet in Nuh, and the list goes on. And then at the end of that, the last prophet that comes, Isa and his mother, alayhim as then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this is your ummah, all of you are one. What does that mean? That means the religion was one from the time of Nuh, from the time of Adam. So when a person doesn't follow Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa there are so many things that are wrong with that. And it can go all the way back for us to say, look, this person is leaving the way of all of the Anbiya and the Rusul. Especially if it comes into innovation, when it comes to the Akhbar. You are believing about things that Adam didn't believe in. Let alone Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Hence, that's why we are being commanded to follow this religion in this manner. Because this is the religion that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given it to the best of mankind. Otherwise, what will happen is you'll be following the people who are disobedient. Because the people who innovate are the people of disobedience. And you're believing the way of not just one prophet, but all of the prophets. Hence Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah, he said, Man mata al-Islam was sunnah whoever dies upon Islam and the Sunnah. He didn't just say Islam. And we've talked about Sunnah before. Here he's not talking about Sunnah when it comes to how we understand Sunnah. Here he is talking about the methodology. <coughs> Staying away from innovation and sticking to what has been narrated. <laughs> that person has died upon all forms of goodness. One of the companions, Rudinan, Hudayf bin Yaman, he says, كل عبادة لم يتعبدها أصحاب رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فلا تعبدوها فإن الأول لم يدع الآخر مقالا Every act of worship that the companions did not do, do not do it. Meaning, if they didn't do it, you don't do it. If, if these people have innovated something that the companions didn't do, then do not follow it. 
because the people who came before have left for those people who came afterwards a precedence. And those people who come afterwards, they are not the precedents. Hudayf ibn Yaman. Ibn Masud said, Tabi'u atharana, follow our footsteps, follow our narrations. Wala tabtadi'u, do not innovate. Fakad kufitu, because you have been sufficed. Wa alaykum bil atik, and it is upon you, upon the ancient way. Now, if you can understand that word that he is using, he's not just referring to the Messenger of Allah. So, alaykum bil atik, atik is ancient, all the way back to Adam alayhi salam. Look at this narration. Now we are definitely living in a time of a lot of fitna. This is found in the introduction of Imam Muslim in his Sahih. Now this is just a side point. A lot of people make this uh, error. What Imam Muslim puts in his introduction is not necessarily Sahih. The criterion of his uh, of his Sahih, the Hadith, which is Sahih, what you find in the introduction is not the same criteria. This is just an introduction where he is talking. I mean, I'm not trying to say that he's da'if or anything, but it's not that level of, you know, calibre and that strictness. Regardless, irrespective of what we have just said, this is found now, this is really worrying. Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As, he says, In the oceans, there are shayateen who are chained up. Awthaqaha Sulaiman. Sulaiman is the one who chained them up and he fastened them in the oceans. Do not come out. You are not going to come out. Abdullah ibn Amr. Now there's no other way except that the Messenger of Allah told him. This is something from the unseen. He said, Yushaku an takhruj fataqra al nasi qur'ana. It will be soon time that these shayateen will come out of the ocean. These shayateen will come out of the ocean, appearance of men, and they will recite to people Quran. What does that mean? They will deviate people, they will corrupt people with the appearance of them trying to be pious. Imam Malik, rahimahullah, he says, Man ibtada' fil islami bid'ah, yiraha hasana, anyone who innovates into the religion, he thinks that this is a good thing, he's doing a good thing. فَقَدْ زَعْمَ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدٍ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمْ خَانَ الرِّسَالَةِ And this person is accusing Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam of not completing the message. He was treacherous towards the message. Why? Either because there was something that he didn't tell us and that you needed to innovate it, or you know better than him. Hence, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Imam Malik is saying here, this is his tafsir, al-yawma akmaltu lakum deenakum. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, today we have completed your religion. For ma alam yakun yawma idhin deenan, when was, whatever at that time was not religion, falan yakun yawm deena, it cannot be religion today. Imam Malik, rahimahullah. This is just the introduction, like I said, of uh, a very important topic and inshallah a very beneficial book we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he has mercy on the shaykh and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps his firm upon the sunnah and away from all forms of deviation we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he is pleased with us and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he grants us beneficial knowledge and righteous actions we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he keeps us steadfast upon la ilaha illallah and the following of his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Allahumma amanna faktubna min shahideen Allah we have believed so make us of those who we have recorded as those who have witnessed the coming of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Hada, wallahu alam, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Muhammad, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Any questions? Everyone looks really tired. <laughs> 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 <laughs>